Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Avi, for the invitation. So I didn't realize this was an experiment, but OK. I guess now you tell me. Of course I will tell you. Yeah, exactly. OK, so yeah, so today I will talk about uh, um, a sort of a new version of, a, of the local lemma, which you can think of as a non-probabilistic or algorithmic version. But there will not be many, in the, many proofs in the talk. I'll just give a very high level idea of the, of the proof. And then tomorrow, I hope to give the complete proof on the board. It'll take about uh, two hours, maybe. So this is joint work with Fotis Iliopoulos, who is now a student at UC Berkeley. You can hear me OK in the back? Yep. OK. So let me start by reminding you what is the Lovas local lemma setting. So we have some probability space in which we have defined some subset of events, some subsets of it to denote as bad events. And we would like to find an elementary event in the probability space such that none of the bad events occurs. So clearly, if the events are independent, then the probability that no bad event occurs is equal to the product of the probability of the complement. And uh, then the probability that none of them happens is strictly positive. But uh, the question becomes interesting when you're in a, in a situation in which avoiding one bad event makes other bad events more likely. So as a very simple example, consider the case where you just have three binary variables and you consider the uniform measure on the, on the cube. And uh, the events that we would like to avoid are the di dissatisfaction of these clauses. So if I tell you, for example, that the first clause is uh, satisfied, so we have avoided the first bad event, well, now it has become more likely that x2 is set to 1, which makes it less likely that this clause will be satisfied. So we have increased the probability of this bad event. So the nature of the interaction is captured by the fact that these two clauses want different things to happen to variable x2. So the Lovas local lemma says, well, if there isn't too much conflict going on, the probability that nothing bad will happen is still positive. You can bound it away from 0. So one, uh, perhaps the most classical formulation of the lemma, is that for each event i, you have some neighborhood of events with which it interacts. And you demand that it is mutually independent of all other events. And uh, there is also this uh, weighting business, which we don't have to sort of go over right now. And then you want that you find appropriate weights for the events, such that this inequality holds. And then the probability that nothing but happens is bounded below by, by something which is positive, but typically exponentially small. So a corollary that captures the basic idea, I think, in a much more easily digestible form is that if each event is mutually independent of all events except for those that we designate to be in the neighborhood, and then for each event, the sum of the probabilities of the events in its neighborhood is bounded by one quarter, then everything works out. So is Shoot, yes. Ah. So yes, this is epsilon j. Thanks, Javi. Uh, for this notation, I mean, just uh, yes. much more uh, to have a graph. Than you have, uh, sure. So. So you have a vertex for each event now. And then you only connect to events if they are not independent. So now what we do is for each event, we sort of take the summation over its neighborhood events. And we just ask that they are not very likely. So in aggregate, their probability can be as big as, as one quarter. And um, <clears throat> a stronger version replaces the independence condition with the non-boosting condition. So this is exactly the same formulation as before, except that now we require that each event is not necessarily independent from the vast majority of other events, but the vast majority of other events have the property that they never boost this event. So you can be correlated as long as you're correlated in the, in the right direction. So there should be only few events that boost the probability of a bad event happening. Then everything else stays, stays the same. So here's an example that shows sort of the, the power of the LLL. 
here's a statement that says every KCNF formula where each clause shares variables with at most 2 to the k divided by Euler's constant other clauses is satisfiable. And uh, you can just prove this by, by the LLL in a very straightforward, straightforward way. You take the uniform measure on the binary cube. The events are the dissatisfactions of the different clauses. And observe that if two clauses don't share any variables, then they're clearly independent from one another. So the notion of conflict is captured by the notion of sharing and, in fact, disagreeing on a variable. So I don't need to define what KCNF is, right? No? Yes? It's maybe a good idea. Sorry, OK. Yeah. So a KCNF is just the case where you have Boolean variables, xi1 or xi2 or xik. And then so k is in KCNF, and then maybe some of them are negated. Okay. So the example I gave before was a 3CNF. And then so in this example, the two clauses share, <laughs> share this variable. So that's right. Yes, in fact, we will see something even stronger, which is that this is tight. So there exist unsatisfiable formulas, formulas that have no satisfying truth assignments, in which the amount of conflict is barely greater than what, uh, than what the LLL allows. So it comes pretty close to capturing the threshold between sat and unsat, if at least the measure by which you consider things is the the degree of, of the different clauses. So I mean, the LLL has about a half a page proof. And it's uh, one of those mysterious inductions that you look at it, and you look at it, and you look at it, and it's not exactly clear what's happening. It's very clear that it works. It's not very clear what is going on. But anyhow, um, a question that was asked pretty much as soon as the LLL came about is, OK, you can prove that a satisfying assignment exists, or more generally, an elementary event as you like exists. But can you find such an elementary event efficiently? And people worked on this problem for a very long time. And uh, until 2008 or so, for example, in the case of satisfiability, you could find efficiently a satisfying truth assignment if the amount of conflict was as high as 2 to the k over 4, which is a very big difference from 2 to the k over e. And this was a long series of results, some of them pretty technically heavy. And then there was a, a breakthrough by Robin Moser in 2009, who showed that you can match this almost up to, up to a constant. And the running time is, uh, is very low. So the amount of time it takes to find such a satisfying assignment is proportional to the number of variables in the formula and the number of clauses times the logarithm of the number of clauses. And in fact, you can refine Moser's argument to completely match um, what you get from the, from the existential LLL. And what was perhaps most surprising about Moser's uh, argument was that the algorithm by which you find the satisfying assignment is incredibly simple. The analysis is ingenious, but I'll tell you the algorithm, and the algorithm is just brilliant. The algorithm says, pick a random truth assignment in the beginning, which you can think of pick a random elementary event in, uh, in the probability space. And then pick any bad event. So pick any formula that is unsatisfiable. Or any clause, excuse me, any clause that is unsatisfiable. Well, one thing that you know for sure in life is that this particular combination shouldn't be happening. That's one thing that you know for sure. Assume that you know nothing else. So just re-randomize the variables of this clause. That's it. That's the algorithm. 
So just keep doing that. And the idea is that precisely by the fact that you are pushing the probability measure in the direction suggested away from the violated clauses, you will eventually reach a configuration in which nothing will be violated. But it is sort of difficult to imagine an algorithm simpler than this. I mean, the only simpler algorithm I can think of is just keep beating random entire assignments. Okay? Well, that's not going to work because in all interesting cases, the satisfying assignments are exponentially rare. But short of that, it seems like the next possible simplest algorithm is Moses' algorithm. So, and uh, shortly thereafter, Moser was joined uh, by Gabor Tardos, and together they showed that they can make the Lovas Loca Lemma algorithmic in a pretty general context. And their context is that the probability measure is a product measure. So you have the set omega. And you assume that the set omega has some kind of decomposition into variables. That's a fairly common scenario. So for example, you can have n Boolean variables, which is 0, 1, so 2 to the n possible configurations. And moreover, the measure you are considering, the probability measure that you're interested in, is a product measure. So each variable has some probability distribution, and the measure is just generated by sampling independently from those different, uh, from those different distributions. And then the theorem is that if you have such a probability measure, and your events satisfy the conditions of the original local lemma, then by doing the obvious generalization of the algorithm I described, you can find an elementary event such that none of the bad events holds in time proportional to the number of events. So basically, you sample from the measure, then you look at any bad event, it doesn't matter which one, and then you resample the variables of that bad event. And then you just keep doing this. And then the claim is that the overall number of violated bad events will shrink over time down to zero. So this, uh, the, the algorithm of Moser and Tardos, and in particular this variable setting, has a number of additional uh, nice properties. You can actually make the algorithm parallel. You can de-randomize it. Um, and then Kolipaka and Segedi prove that the algorithm works even under a condition which is weaker than the condition of the LLL. And one property that I like in particular is that you can prove that if the events um, intersect each other in a certain additionally nice way, then the algorithm will finish in polynomial time even, um, even if the number of events is exponential. So although there are exponentially many bad things, if they are nicely structured, you will go down to zero bad things happening in a polynomial amount of time. And I, I, to me, the intuition is somewhat analogous to the case where you maybe have a system that is specified by an exponential number of constraints. But if you have a separation oracle, then you can actually get down to satisfying everything in polynomial time. I think so. But maybe this is just personal, uh, personal intuition, yes. So. <laughs> so now the main, um, the main downside of the, of the Moser Tardos proof is that it really de depends very heavily on, uh, on mu being a product measure. So it doesn't work at all if you try to apply it on, uh, on uh, non-product measures. And so in particular, it doesn't extend to the lopsided LLL. So you really need to have independence as opposed to one-sided dependency. And uh, even if you have independence, it is very hard to extend even to simple non-product spaces. So consider, for example, the case where omega, the set of elementary events, is the set of all possible permutations on n elements. And then you consider the uniform measure on all permutations. OK, that's a pretty nice and simple setting. Observe that now the independence is, is very difficult to establish, because as soon as I tell you that element 3 goes to location 7, I have actually polluted the information about what happens to where every other element goes. So if I tell you that 3 goes to 7, I have informed you a tiny, tiny amount about, uh, about other stuff, but enough to make the proof not go through. And then Harrison, Trenivasan showed that they can expand, uh, sorry, they can uh, expand the, uh, the Moser Tardos uh, framework to this case. But you know, it takes 30 pages of pretty hard labor for, for a very, very simple, simple setting as this. So that's one, one limitation. Another um, limitation is that 
in order to have a product measure, you need some kind of a decomposition of the underlying space into variables. And something like that is not always readily available. For example, it could be that even the base set omega, you would like it to be a complicated set. You would like it, the set itself to be the set of all Hamiltonian cycles of a graph, and then maybe you are seeking some additional property. So it requires that omega has a very, very, very simple description. And in general, you don't, you know, you don't want to have this description. Um, but perhaps what is, in my opinion, the biggest, uh, the biggest limitation is that if you insist on having a product measure going through this resampling procedure, the rules are, yes, you are allowed to pick any bad event and resample, but you must resample using the original measure. So you have some original measure on the probability space. You pick an initial element. Now you have some kind of bad event. You're allowed to resample its variables to try to make progress, but the resampling has to be completely oblivious to the environment. It doesn't matter what is happening to the other clauses, what is happening around you. These are the rules of the game. And from an algorithm's point of view, that's not terribly interesting. In some sense, all the cleverness is already embedded in the initial probability measure. Okay. So as an example where this kind of uh, fails dramatically, is consider the problem where you have a very a simple graph of maximum degree delta, and your goal is to color the vertices of the graph so that adjacent vertices have different colors. Now, trivially, you can do this with delta plus one colors, because I can put your vertices in an arbitrary order. And then every time I need to color something, it has at most delta neighbors. So at most delta colors are forbidden, so I can just add it a new color. So delta plus one suffices. But if you try to give a bound on the chromatic number of a graph using the LLL, it turns out the best you can prove is that you need at least e times delta, so a multiplicative constant more. And the reason is roughly the following. Imagine that you have come up with a vertex coloring, and now there is some edge which is violated, and you have decided, OK, I will recolor this vertex to try to get rid of this problem. According to the rules of the game, the color that you have to assign this vertex is uniformly random over all available colors. You can't say, oh, I will try to avoid the colors that are currently in the neighbors. So in order for a blind choice for this to avoid all delta colors that might already be assigned, you need to be a certain amount of richness in the choice that is available here. And that richness is manifest in precisely asking for e times delta color so that the probability that you have a new collision is as small as something like 1 over e. And that, that is good enough. So um, to extend this into, into non-product spaces, uh, what we propose to do is to completely get rid of the measure. So we will actually start from scratch. And we are not going to have a probability measure. We'll just have a set. And then we will cast everything in algorithmic terms. And we will see that somehow this is liberating, and it allows you to do more things that you could do before. So that's the proposal. So now I will introduce a few notions. There, there is a number of them, but the nice thing is they have very good, I think, analogs to the previous settings. So I will try to highlight those. So again, like before, we will work with some discrete set, finite. The difference is that this time it's going to be an arbitrary set. Meaning, so yes, it could have product structure like the cube, but it can be more complicated. It can be like the set of all possible permutations on n elements. But more interestingly, it can be the set of all Hamiltonian cycles of a graph. Or it can be the set of all valid edge Q colorings of a graph. So both of these are sets that have very high complexity to describe. They are not obvious. obvious. So this is going to be our base set. And, uh, the analog of the events now, just like this is the obvious thing, is going to be arbitrary subsets of omega. So yes? Uh, it's not even clear like, how to sample the Hamiltonian cycle. That's right. So uh, any algorithm version, like resampling or sampling, like all the previous yes. So typically, um, typically, you will want to be in a setting in which finding a single Hamiltonian cycle is easy. So for example, if you have a sufficient lower bound on the minimum degree of the graph, this readily implies the existence of a Hamiltonian cycle, but also finding one relatively efficiently. But it will be true, and that's sort of one of the features of the work, 
that in order to make progress, you don't need to be able to sample from the original space. It is enough to get any kind of foothold in it. So you can get an arbitrary initial space. As long as you can enter omega, and then you, s you have rules that allow you to crawl inside omega in a certain sense, you can make progress. OK? So it is true that I need someone to allow me to enter omega. This much is true. And of course, for you know, arbitrary graph G, such purchase on omega is, is, not, is not feasible, yes? But does this answer your question? OK. So the bad events, just like before, are going to correspond to subset, except this time we're going to call them flaws. So you have a collection of objects. And a flaw is a subset of that object encoding the fact that they share some common negative characteristic. So for example, I, I'll give some examples, some examples below. So if you have a satisfiability formula like before, and you have a specific clause, then if you set the variables in that clause so as to violate the clause, then the subcube, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do with your remaining assignments. So these subcubes corresponds to the flow that corresponds to, to, the, to the particular clause. If you were interested, let's say, that the, if, if your object of interest were derangement, so this is permutations where nobody maps to themselves, then you could say that you have one flow for each index i containing all the permutations which have the property that p of i equals i. So you would have n flows. Um, then um, a more interesting problem is known as acyclic edge coloring. So in acyclic edge coloring, you're given a graph, and you would like to find valid edge colorings of the graph. So meaning whenever two edges meet, they must have different colors, the two edges. So that's one requirement. That's just edge coloring. Acyclic edge coloring means that if you now look into any cycle in the graph, you will see at least three distinct colors. So you cannot have a bichromatic cycle. Okay? So that's a problem. In that case, the basic set omega is this, OK? And you, know, you can show that if you have a sufficient number of colors, it's easy to find a basic coloring. But now you will have a flow corresponding to each cycle and observe that you can have an exponential number of cycles, OK? So a flow is, corresponds to a cycle and says, well, if you color this in this way, I'm unhappy. If this cycle takes two colors, I'm unhappy, no matter what you do everywhere else. So is it clear what the setting is? So we have an arbitrary set omega and arbitrary subsets of them. And what we would like to do is we would like to find an element which is not present in any of the bad subsets. So just like before, it's the intersection of the complements of the bad events that we're interested in. And we'd like to find an element. And we're not going to just prove that it exists. And we're not going to, of course, assume that it exists. But we will show how to come up with an algorithm which efficiently will get you there. So that's the setting. So <clears throat> I will think of my set omega now as a giant state space, because I will walk on it. So to emphasize this view, I will write the different elements of omega as sigmas instead of omegas. And uh, I will denote by u of sigma the number of flaws that are contained the state, OK? Except rather than, I will sometimes say that you know, a flow is present at a state, whereas in reality, it's the other way around. It's the flow that's present in the, in the state. So u of sigma will be the flows that are present in a particular state sigma. And a state is flawless if, obviously, u of sigma is empty. So our goal is whenever a flawless object exists, find one in time significantly less than just enumerating over omega. That's the high level goal. And the high level approach is we're going to specify a directed graph D on omega such that if a state is flawed, it has out degree at least one. And then we're going to take a uniformly random walk until we hit a state which is a sink. That's it. OK, that's the, that's the high level idea. And oh, sorry, I, I guess I should have said, you know, if something is flawless, it has out degree 0, it's a sink. On the other hand, the only way you can have out degree 0 is if you are a sink. So yes? What, what is the random? Is it just local search? Yeah, you can think of this largely as local search, that's right. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. But the random walk always makes 
so the next slide I think will answer the so here are are the rules so for every state for every flow present in that state so uh, you will see here that I'm somewhat of you might think I'm a bit over demand over demanding I, I will explain in a second so for every state for every flow present in the state I'd ask to have a non-empty set of actions so these are the actions for addressing flow f at state sigma. And this is nothing but a subset of omega. So you are here and you suffer from flow f. You have to move. This is not a good place. Where will you go? So the set of possible places that you may go is a subset of omega. And this is the collection of actions available for dealing with flow f at state sigma. All places you can go? All places you can go to. That's right. No, so far I haven't even said that. Oh, yeah. I didn't even say, I, so an act, that's right, an action, so addressing a flow represents an effort to get rid of the flow. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will get rid of the flow. Okay? So for every state, for every flow that is present in that state, you, may, you have to be able to say, okay, to deal with this, or precisely to, to address this, I will go to one of these. And uh, so each place to which you may go to address flow f at state sigma, I sort of write this down by putting an arc from sigma to tau, OK? Because this is where you were. This is where you will go. But I also put an f above to signify that this transition was made in the attempt to get rid of flow f, OK? So observe that this is a multi-digraph. Meaning, I may have multiple arcs between a particular pair of states. So if this is sigma, this is tau. But they have, have different flows. Okay, So you can think of this perhaps are saying, imagine that you have a clause which is currently violated. Well, the, uh, or you may have two clauses that are currently violated. Both are violated and they share this variable at the bottom. When you resample this variable and you change it, this is a way to get rid of this flow. It's also a way to get rid of that. Of that. So it's the same action. Okay, so you go from the same sigma to tau, but sometimes you charge it to fixing this clause. Maybe sometimes you charge it to fixing that clause. Okay, the, the general setting still is, is completely amorphous. For every state, for every problem present in that state, you need to have at least one other place to which to go. That's it. Th these are the rules. And each such possible transition you ascribe to the particular flow that you try to get rid of. So now I'm going to introduce a, a condition, and then I will advocate for that condition. My condition is that I never have the following situation. I never have two arcs, so this is sigma 1 and this is sigma 2, that both go to the same state tau and are labeled by the same flow. OK? This is what the, I, I make this demand, and that's the only demand I will make. So is the, is the, demand, the nature of the demand is clear, right? I'm saying you never have two distinct states going to the same place while addressing the same flow. Now, I think abstractly, it is not at all clear why, why do I want this. Um, but first, let me try to convince you about the intuition behind it. So by the way, this is, this is wrong. I mean, this is, uh, is implied by is what I mean here. So if I have those two things, those two properties, they imply this. So what are those two things? The first one is that flows are partial assignments. So for example, in the case of satisfiability, you tell me if you assign this variable to this value, this variable to this value, this variable to this value, then it doesn't matter what you do with the rest. So my first requirement is that if we're in a variable setting, I want it to be the case that every flow corresponds to a partial assignment. So to, to, to specify a flow, you simply specify a forbidden combination of values for some particular collection of variables. That's it. 
And the second, and so this I will now argue is not a restriction. This one is a genuine restriction, but we will see that it is meaningful. So it's Yes. Sorry, so what I meant to say is this condition in a setting where we have variables, it, I, this is wrong, is implied by the combination of these two things. So in the setting of variables, if you have the following two things, you get atomicity. So the first thing is each flow is a partial assignment. Okay? The second, which is substantial, is if you want to address some specific flow in some specific state, you are only allowed to mess with the variables of that flow. You can do anything you like, but you're only allowed to mess with the variables of this specific flow that you are purportedly addressing. So if there is a clause that you want to satisfy, you can do anything you like to its variables, but you're not allowed to touch the variables that don't appear in the clause. Yes? Are you assuming that no two clauses have the same subset of variables? No. Not at all. What if there are two clauses which have the same subset? Oh, you mean identical? Identical subset of variables, just different. Okay. Subsets. But remember that this action, any action, is charged to a specific flow, yes? So my requirement is you are not allowed to touch variables that don't belong in this flow. Obviously, these variables will belong to other flows as well. It's a very reasonable thing. I mean, most algorithms that we know actually do have this property. This is called focusing. OK? So if there is a constraint over a collection of variables which is currently violated, the requirement is that you're only allowed to change the variables of this constraint in order to make things better. You shouldn't change variables that at least prima facie, a priori, are irrelevant. Right? That's what I'm asking. So I'm asking for two things. The first one is the way that you specify flows is as partial assignments. So for example, in the case of graph coloring, the natural way to represent a constraint is to say these two vertices cannot have the same color. It's an equality constraint. Okay? Here, I will somehow, in order to have a uniform treatment of everything, I will actually demand that you flatten this very explicitly and say, no, what is forbidden is red, red, green, green, blue, blue, yellow, yellow. So if you had four colors, you will now have to write four constraints. That's all, OK? But this is a purely syntactic requirement. It just makes life easy. Because this way, you can treat all problems in a uniform fashion, OK? What is genuinely an algorithmic restriction is to say, your actions must have the property that when you try to address a flow, the only variables that you mess with you can mess in any way you like, but you cannot touch variables that appear to be irrelevant. OK? So this is the, the sort of the moral justification for this. As we are digging deeper in this work, we're realizing that, in fact, perhaps a better way of explaining this, although that doesn't have such a clean characterization, is that we want expansion. OK? We would like it to be the case that if you look at the states that suffer from a specific flow, and you look at the image through the collection of items of this flow to the rest of the set, you would like this to expand. You would like this to be big. And this corresponds to search space exploration. So this is a very convenient way to guarantee expansion, because you have no collisions. Okay, Now this gives you directly a way to, to compare the rates. But I personally find it satisfying that it also has sort of a, a natural interpretation in, in, in this fashion, yeah. Yes. I think so. I guess. I mean, you can think it's the same flow, no? But you mean different, uh, or different orientation? Sorry. The what? Are different flows. That's right. Why? Yes. Yes. So uh, uh, each one. You treat assignment uh, partial assignment. Okay. This is flow. This so this is one flow. So it basically says that zero zero 
is bad. So that's a partial assignment that's bad. And this one says 0, 1 is bad. <laughs> That's right. Okay. That's right. This is important. This is important, right? I, I try to say it, maybe I didn't emphasize it enough. Every action has a justification. Okay? So there is accountability. Every time you make a transition, you have to say, the reason I did this is because of this flaw. This accountability aspect is very important. Okay? And we may even have the same transition from sigma to tau having two different accountability paths. You can take this action to address flow one, or you can take it to address flow two. It's the same transition, but it is important that you have this accountability. Clear? OK. I, I said, that's right. That's right. To address the flow. That's right. That's the goal. The goal. So that's the word that the term I use is to address. You try to address a flow. So this is suggestive of the fact that you will typically get rid of it, but it is not a strict requirement that you will get rid of it. Yes. So for, for that's right. That's right. So this is this is a good example. In the case of satisfiability, if you have actually think of graph coloring, okay? I have k colors, and let's even pretend that to fix a particular edge that is currently monochromatic, red, red. What I do is I pick a uniformly random color for this and a uniformly random color for that, right? Typically, this will fix the problem, but sometimes it won't. Okay. So the action of, let's say, resampling both is my effort to address the flow. And it amounts to choosing between one of k squared alternatives. So there will be k squared actions, the different colors to which I can go. And I will pick one of those uniformly at random. And that represents my effort to get rid of that flow. And I will off more often succeed than not. Yeah. So. This is one form of justification for this. Expansion and search space exploration in another form of justification for this. And then finally, there is this pragmatic form of, of justification, which is for a bunch of problems that we try to apply this, you start off and you might have some idea about what the flaws should be. There's natural flaws. And then you try to find actions. And then this combination of flaws and actions doesn't quite work. It doesn't achieve atomicity. Okay? And then you fool around with it to achieve atomicity. And achieving atomicity tends to be helpful. Okay? You actually end up designing a better algorithm. So it's a good thing to try to, to impose. Oftentimes, you don't even have to think. Or you can say, OK, if I define those flaws, what actions are atomic? So you, you know, you, you, I would think that actions represent algorithm design. So in some sense, a significant part of algorithm design is supplanted just by the requirement of achieving atomicity. So it falls out. So OK, so that's the setting. So let me just work through a couple of examples to make sure we're on the same page. So if a KCNF formula, so omega is the cube, flows correspond to closes, actions correspond to flows are subcubes, exactly. And then the actions for addressing a particular flow in a particular state, for example, could be all the possible mutations of this truth assignment by messing through the variables of the clause. So then you can get the original bound to the k over e. If it's graph coloring, then omega is all possible colorings of the graph. Observe that now, because of atomicity, a flow corresponds not just to a pair of vertices, but to a pair of vertices and a color. So I demand that we have equality to the color. And now, to address a particular flow, I can say, in the naive world, I will say, consider all possible Q mutations of sigma through V. So just take the vertex and recolor it. And if you do that, you get the old result. But you can now. Since you have full freedom, you're not restricted by a measure or any kind of requirement of regularity, you can simply say, no, actually, I will only consider mutations, so the recolorings of the vertex that don't lead to mutual conflicts. And now you just recover completely the, the, the algorithm, the algorithm result. 
myself as an example. So to state the theorem, I need to introduce three quantities. I, I think all three of them are sort of pretty natural. So the first one is what I will call the amenability of a flow. So ignore this mean for a moment. So whenever you are in a particular state and you want to address a particular flow, there is a collection of actions that are available to you. So in some state, you have 10 actions available. In another state, you have 15 actions. In another state, you have seven actions, OK? So think of this as the width of the repertoire of actions with which you can address this flow. In principle, you would like this to be big. Somehow, this suggests that if there is many, many ways to deal with a flow, that's an easy flow to deal with. So take the minimum of the repertoire width over the entire state space. So the amenability of a flow is the minimum over the entire number of, of the entire state space of the number of choices you will have to address this particular flow. So what is that? Yes, because otherwise it's yes. So so this is a quantity we want to be big. Okay. Now the central definition, and this is what replaces the notion of correlation in the Lovas local lemma, is what I will call the potential causality. So what does potential causality mean? A flow I causes a flow J if there exists any, and that's the big weakness, transition in the entire system such that in order to get rid of flow I, we went from state sigma to state tau, and flow J is present in tau, but it wasn't present in sigma. Or we failed to get rid of the flow that we tried to address. Okay? So for example, in a KCNF, if I resample all k variables uniformly, there is still a 1 over 2 to the k chance that I will just stay where I put. I, I did a self-loop, yes? So I, want, I am in a particular state in which clause 52 is violated, yes? So for whatever reason, maybe there's other violated clauses in that state. I have chosen to address clause 52. To address clause 52, I need to go to some other state. So this is the collection of actions available to me. I could choose to make this set have two to the k elements corresponding to all possible value assignments to this clause while leaving everything else untouched. Correct? I see. So you're saying it's just uh, uh, the edge is just an attempt to fix it. Exactly. It exactly. It doesn't always fix it. Typically, it will. But see, for technical reasons, sometimes it's convenient to leave in, for the countings, to leave in the possibility that you do a self-loop, for example. So in, in principle, I could have very well just said the set of actions for addressing a clause has size 2 to the k minus 1. That would not be a problem at all, OK? I, I just sort of, it is easier to have a, un, a framework that allows for the possibility of not getting rid of a flow even if you tried, OK? So for example, in a world in which when you try to fix a clause, you allow the possibility of self-loop, the flow that corresponds to the clause causes itself. Because there exist transitions in which you take an action to get rid of this flow and you fail. So the I, I want to sort of make sure that everybody gets, because this is the most important definition in the whole thing. Okay? So look at a specific transition, not the entire set. So you were at sigma, and you suffered from flow 52. OK? And then you said, OK, I'm going to go from this sigma to tau to get rid of flow 52, or at least to try to get flow 52. And maybe you, you succeed. So you go here, and flow 52 is not present. But there is a flow, flow 17, which was not present here, and it is present here. So this is a flow that was introduced by the effort to get rid of the first flow. OK? So in a KCNF, it is necessary, that's right, that we share a variable, OK? And I think that we disagree on it also, OK? Clearly, if we don't share variables, it cannot happen, OK? It's clear that some potential causality has to be studied in the analysis because you are trying to get rid of all the That's right. So the general idea is when you try to get rid of this flow, what flaws may you introduce? 
That's basically the question. Over the entire state space. Is, this, is, the, is the definition clear? So a specific transition you try to, is charged to a specific flow. Yes? So for every transition, we charge it to some flow at the time that we're taking it. And then we look at flows that are present in the destination that were not present in the original. Okay? And then we say that, well, taking this transition to address flow i caused flow j if j is in the destination but was not in the original. Special case, I tried to address flow i and flow i is still present, then I also say that i caused i. That's it. Yes. So, so, okay. This can be thought of as a projection. So I had my set omega. On omega, I defined an algorithm, basically. What is an algorithm? An algorithm is a directed graph. So the way that I run the algorithm is I enter omega somewhere, and then I repeatedly take a uniformly random action among those available. So actually, more precisely, I enter omega. I decide which of the potentially many flows present I want to address. Flows, yes. So maybe 25 flows. Okay, I decide somehow. I'm not addressing that that part yet, but I want to address flow 17. Flow 17 has 25 possible actions. I choose one of them uniformly at random, and I go there. There, there are some other collection of flows present, maybe including the one that I just tried to avoid. I choose one of those to address, and among the actions available for doing so at that state, I choose one uniformly at random. Right? That's my process. That's what happens in the big graph. Now, I want to define an appropriate notion of projection. Okay? And the causality digraph is a lossy compression of what is happening up here. And it is lossy in the sense of any. Okay? It's basically saying, look, if there is ever a case in which in trying to fix 52, you introduce 16, we have to say that in general, 52 potentially causes 16. And then I have this digraph where things point to the things that flows point to the flows that they may cause. Fair enough. So this is clear? Exactly. So the name of the game, right? What is the name of the game? The name of the game is to maintain sparsity in the projected graph. That's the name of the game. Right? What is the enemy of sparsity? The enemy of sparsity is any. Right? How can I try to achieve sparsity in the face of any? To achieve sparsity in the face of any, I need coherence. Coherence means whenever you have a way of trying to deal with something, and here is another very far away place of the space when you try to deal with the same thing, try to make sure that they're somehow cognizant of each other's efforts, and you don't step on everybody's toes. Okay? So I have this tension. On one hand, I want the amenability of a flow to be large. Okay? I want there to be multiple ways of dealing with it. But if there is multiple ways of dealing with it, well, in principle, there will be multiple things I will break. Multiple distinct things I will break. Right? So on the other hand, I want this graph to be sparse. So I have to be clever so that this is big while this remains sparse. But the nice thing is now I don't have some kind of probability measure in the background telling me what reality is. I can design myself to try to achieve a trade-off between those two things, yes? And now my condition is I look at a flow, and then I say, look at the things that it causes, OK? One over their amenability, take the sum, this has to be less than e, 1 over e. Okay? So a particular flow is transient if it has the property that the things that it breaks are relatively easy to deal with. So I am i. I want this index of summation to be small. That's one thing, right? I would like it to be the case that efforts to fix me don't break many others. But to the extent that they do, I would like the others that I break to have large amenability, meaning there to be multiple ways for them to, to be fixed in the system, so that this sum becomes small. So I am a transient flow if this is satisfied for me. 
and the entire algorithm, the digraph, is transient if this is true for all flows. Clear? So if you have this condition, now you get the theorem. And yes, that's right. It's an exact. That's right. It's exactly the condition of the LLL. That's right. So, just to be utterly clear, gain purchase in the set. So enter the set somewhere, and then repeatedly, for definitiveness, I will state it like this: pick a uniformly random flow that is present in the current state. So pick a random violated clause, for example and address it by taking a uniformly random action set, a, random, sorry, a uniformly random action among those available for dealing with this flow in the state. So gain purchase to in the set omega anywhere, and repeatedly pick a random flow, address it by taking a uniformly random action. That's the walk. And then the theorem is, if d is transient, which I defined a second ago, the probability that the walk does not reach a sink within some amount of time is less than 2 to the minus s, where, so s enters here, and then I have this t0. Okay? So this is something like a burning period in a Markov chain. So I will run for a while without any guarantee of um, progress. And then after I pass this critical point, the probability that I will stop in the very next step is constant per step. It okay? drops exponentially. And what is t0? T0 is a function of two natural quantities. And this is really, <coughs> there are no hidden constants here. The size of the set and the number of unsatisfied clauses present, sorry, flows were present where I started. Okay? So if I start in a good state, it will take less. Okay? So for example, is it, but I mean, you know, this is typically already linear, like, OK, n. So my th two things to remark is I don't need a uniformly random element of omega. I can start anywhere. That's one. And the other is that the running time depends on the number of flows that are present in the original state, not the total number of flows to specify my system. So in particular, this can be exponentially large. There are interesting cases in which this is exponentially large. But you can prove that in every state, there are only polynomially many flows that can be present. So you can have an exponential description length to describe what is that you want, but the running time is still polynomial because it depends on this, not on this. And then finally, um, one thing that we don't quite want to know make of yet is if I could sample uniformly from this, I could actually get rid of this part. Somehow it seems that if you gave me an oracle that gave me uniformly random access into omega as a uniformly random place, then the size of it becomes immaterial. OK? Um, yes? Yes, in your theorem, you do have a big O there. Yes. What can you say about that? Sure, sure, sure. It's a, it's a nice big O. I just didn't want to, there's not much hidden. So look at the difference between this term and this term. Yes? Minimize it over all i. So find the tightest inequality. This gives you an epsilon. Fair enough. That epsilon becomes t0 plus s. Sorry, this yes becomes t0 plus s divided by epsilon. OK? So I have this mountain. And the mountain has two ingredients, OK? The size of omega, the logarithm of the size of omega, and the number of clauses, the, or the number of flows that are present in the initial state. Yes? And I eat away at it at a rate which has to do with how far are these inequalities from being tight. That's it. So it is not nasty. In typical applications, you know, it's very far away from, from, from zero. And then finally, the running time has this property that you get this initial period plus s, and then it's exponential in s. So after you run for t0 divided by epsilon steps, which is a fixed amount, then in every step you have constant probability it will stop now. So you have a phase transition phenomenon where the probability that you will stop is sort of 0, and then it shoots up very fast to, to 1. So just to compare 
So this is the general form of the LLL. This is the general form of our main result from the if part of the condition. And what replaces probability is 1 over amenability. OK? That's it. So the statement is identical. And then another thing to note is that you can rewrite this as a sum over all possible subsets of the neighborhood. Just do the binomial expansion of this. Ignore this red thing. Then this would read this would be equivalent to this if you were to ignore the red. This is just a binomial expansion. You can actually strengthen the theorem by showing that you only need to consider subsets of the neighborhood which are independent so that there are no connections between them. So this, so between, I guess, uh, but the point you get to this formulation, you match every known LLL result with the benefit that you can do whatever actions, whatever actions you, you want. Um, Oh my, my concern was that I didn't have enough things to say. Apparently, that was the wrong concern. Um, do I have, I don't have any time, right? Five? You sure? <laughs> Thank you. Oh my, this is embarrassing. The worst part is it happens every time. <laughs> so, okay, so consider the following problem, okay? You give me a complete graph, the edges of which are already colored. And um, the promise that I have is that no color is used too many times. So in particular, I am told that um, uh, I think, yes, no color is used than, let's say, n over 6 times. Every, there is no, you don't see red more than an over, six, uh, over six times on the edges. And what is the goal? The goal is to come up to, to output a perfect matching. Well, that's trivial. It's a clique. But all the colors in it have to be distinct. OK, that's what it makes it rainbow. Is this clear? So I have the complete clique on two n vertices. I'm supposed to return a perfect matching such that all the colors of the edges are distinct. And what I have as a guarantee is that it is not overrepresented. No color is overrepresented. So <clears throat> I take omega to be the set of all perfect matchings of the complete click on two n vertices, of the complete graph on two n vertices. And now for every pair of vertex disjoint edges, so I have a pair of edges like this or like that, that have the same color, this is red and this is red, flow ij is the collection of matchings that contain both edges. It's a, the most natural definition, I mean, you know, because that's what you're trying to avoid. Okay. And what is the result? The result is if no color is used more than n over 2e times, then the running, you, you find something in time n squared log n. So what's the algorithm? The algorithm is these are the two edges, both of which are red. This is the flow that I'm trying to address. OK? So in order to address this flow, I will find two other edges, the color of which is unknown. This is what I'm trying to sort of signify by having multiple things here. So between them, they will form these two subgraphs. And um, what am I going to do is I'm going to, in each one of these, either take these two edges or the cross. That's my action. Does that make sense? So I start off with two red edges. I clearly cannot have both in my matching. So what I will do is I will actually replace both of them. To replace both of them, for each of the two, I select a victim edge, which is other than this. So this guy selects an edge which is not this one, so it selects this one. And now this guy selects an edge which is neither this one nor that one. It turns out to be that one. And they have some color. Okay. And now, between those two, I can select either these, so I flip a coin, so that's one action, or these two, that's another action. And similarly for, for here. And now, you can see that this is atomic, but not in, sorry, the amount of time that I have left. But my point, the main point I come up with this example is, we didn't think of this. Atomicity told us what to do. 
So more precisely, what happens is you can start with the algorithm that says, pick one edge and try to swap one edge out of the two in this fashion. You still get atomicity, but the numbers don't work out. You don't get an algorithm. Then you say, OK, can I try two? And then in two edges, you already are injecting sufficient randomness into the system that things work out. But you don't think, we didn't come up with this idea by ourselves. Atomicity tells you, if this is the new matching, and this is the flaw that you tried to address, that's the old matching. So atomicity, from a technical point of view, achieves, OK, I guess this is a, this is a point that I, I should have made a lot more clearly. So remember, atomicity says, I cannot have two transitions from sigma 1 to sigma 2 into tau for addressing the same flow, yes? So this says, if you tell me the final state of my walk, and you also tell me the sequence of flows that I addressed in the course of getting there, I can actually retrace the entire trajectory in the system. right? Because if I am at a given state now, this is the final state, and you told me that I came here by addressing flow f, it couldn't have been. I know where I came from, because I couldn't have any kind of ambiguity. So this is saying that in order for the walk to take a very, very long time, it has to keep addressing flow after flow after flow after flow, which means that there has to be a great diversity of sequences of flows to be addressed. Okay, And a sparse causality graph is an obstacle to such diversity. That's the, that's the bottom line of, 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 the, of, of the proof. So this is an example. One, uh, one, I think, really nice uh, problem to try to tackle is sparse linear programming, which might appear to be rather, uh, rather ambitious. But imagine that um, I have linear inequalities such that each inequality involves few variables. And each variable is um, involved in few inequalities. Can I then actually prove non-emptiness of the intersection in this way? And one thing that seems to be um, positive so far is that both the notion of convexity and the idea of using recursion along the lines of doing something like the random facet pop up when you try to. Now, is there a type of this, I forget, this abstract version of the linear program? No. No. Yes, but, that, but, yes, but no. <laughs> Because there's this sort of abstract linear program. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. I, yes. I don't know how much of convexity we are really, really capturing. capturing, right? But the idea of convexity does emanate when you try to compare, does this flow cause that other flow? Incorporating convexity helps in figuring out, in figuring out causality. But from a syntactic point of view, the setting is the obvious setting. You have n explicit variables, m explicit inequalities, and you turn it into a discrete problem by considering all the places where they intersect. So at each intersection point, you ask yourself, which, which inequalities are being? Uh, that was the abstract Kalai setting. Well, I mean, the Kalai setting had the, I mean, the relationship between the By the way, I mean, this is so far only just a challenge. I'm not trying to suggest that we're making progress or that we have something concrete to say. But it's a, it's a, it's a nice problem, I think, to try to attack. And it's nice because you, we now don't need to have a background measure. You can choose how to try to fix in a, in, in inequality. Um, I will talk about the proof tomorrow. And then um, that's, I guess, my last slide. So the main point is. You don't have a probability measure anymore. You just have a base set, which is arbitrary, and arbitrary subsets of it. So you don't have to have a decomposition into variables. And the actions that you can take in a particular state can depend on the state. So when you try to get rid of a flow in a particular state, you can take into account the environment so that you minimize the amount of damage that you do. 
Um, and a few things to try in the future is to get the quantum analog of this. We have a backtracking version. This is, I will actually talk about this briefly tomorrow. So in what I talked about today, the object that we evolved was an entire element of omega. So we walked into omega. But another way to try to create, let's say, a partial, a satisfying assignment or a coloring is to satisfy by, to start with something which is empty. So you have not assigned a color or a truth value to anything. And then you try to assign values. And then when you run into trouble, you backtrack. So you undo some of your past choices. So tomorrow I will talk about how you can use this style of analysis to do that. And then one thing that I'm sort of very interested in is the possibility of showing that something like, not exactly the same, but something like the Lovas condition is in fact sufficient to sample from, from the set, not just to find, uh, not just to find a, 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 a good object. It's clear that the LLL condition is not enough. On the other hand, maybe it looks like you don't need that much more in order to, to be able to do to sample a random sync. That's right, exactly. Quantum is the underlying variables are sort of quantum variables. So it would be like quantum sat, for example. So it is, there's no quantum computation. OK? In that sense. Yes? Sorry, just and in some sense, quantum is, is a way that other people talk about it. For me, it's just a, collect there's just a collection of projection matrices. So formulated in terms of what properties must a collection of projection matrices have so that the intersection of the projections is non-empty. Yes. Is there some way of thinking about the no problem you're not using a, an explicit uh, certain number, a more complicated probability function? But, um, is there kind of a concentration thing going on that maybe your this your mm -hmm. the various other conditions that you've placed on this this yes. kind of, uh, construction sort of has as it being more, that the more, the probability distributions that you could define 